Thank you for joining us. Uh, I know that um, all of you have signed up for this webinar because you care about the students in your community. Um, so thank you for your commitment to making sure that these students uh, are served in the way that they should be. Um, my name is Layla, and I am an educator with the B Project. And the B Project is a, a violence prevention group, and we go into schools and other community organizations and talk about ways to prevent different types of relational uh, violences from happening, including bullying, dating, violence, sexual assault, uh, and uh, uh, also with the goal of preventing domestic violence later on down the line, which is what the family place is, a domestic violence shelter. Um, Hi, I'm Janet Dowell, and I am a counselor with the V Project. So mostly what I do is go into high schools, and I have therapeutic groups with teenagers in high schools, and they definitely revolve around teen dating violence prevention. Okay, so that's us, and um, some of the stuff that we're going to do today, I do want to have plenty of time to have uh, questions, as many questions as you all might have. Um, and I'll stop now and then to ask, ask if anyone has questions, um, and then there'll be time at the end uh, to answer other questions um, or concerns as well. So to get started, oops. some of the things that we're going to talk about today, the first part is just kind of a basic 101 with things that um, you should know, terms to know. Um, introducing some of the, the terms and words that I'll be using uh, throughout the presentation that you might not be necessarily familiar with um, or maybe even comfortable with, uh, and that's okay. Um, starting to say the terms and know what they are is one step closer to making sure that we're providing uh, correct services to our students. Um, we're also going to talk about how all of this relates to Title IX. Um, then we're going to talk about some statistics uh, that are happening within the transgender community and how those relate to our students' academic success. Um, and then at the end, we'll be talking about how to create that safe space for these students. How do we get teachers involved, students involved, administration involved, um, and those types of things that we can start taking steps to making sure that we're um, making sure these students are safe. So we have our first question. If Matt, you could bring up the first question. All right. little bit longer so we can get 100% of people answering. And then that question says, uh, have you in the past or do you currently interact with transgender students? It's a simple yes or no question. All right, so most of, the, most of you have answered and it looks like the majority of you have. Um, and uh, so the rest of you that said no, the chances are that you have as well are actually pretty high, uh, and you might just not have known it. Um, it's impossible to know exactly how many transgender people live in the U.S. Um, not all transgender people are going to disclose or even self-identify. Um, so the most commonly cited estimate is about 700,000 transgender people in the United States, um, which is more than the population of Washington, D.C. Um, and most experts in the transgender community do believe that that number is probably higher. Um, but things that might keep people from disclosing would be one that they don't yet self-identify as being transgender, they're still questioning, um, or they, are, they fear disclosure. Um, so that's why those numbers are, for the most part, an, an estimate, but a pretty good one. Um, to put this in terms that might be easier for you to wrap your head around in your own communities, 
is if you're in a high school of 2,000 kids, you're probably going to have somewhere between two and four trans students in that school at any one time. Um, and that is something that's a statistic given by Dr. Norman Speck um, from Boston Children's Hospital. Um, so even though the, those of you who answered no, there's still a good chance that you might have already engaged with or interacted with a transgender student and might just not have known that. Um, <clears throat> so can you bring up, Matt, the second question? The second question is, do you know how Title IX applies to transgender students? And this is a yes or no question. Okay. Um, so while the rest of you are answering that question um, and maybe thinking about that a little bit, um, I want to, before I go into Title IX, because I will be using some of these terms here, um, that you know what they are and are familiar with them before we get into Title IX. Um, so the terms that I'll be commonly using throughout this presentation is gender identity, um, sex, sex as it's assigned at birth, transgender, and gender nonconforming. Um, so I do want to show to explain some of these and then get you familiar with some other terms that I'm not going to be using but aren't necessarily um, separate from um, the issues that we're talking about today. Um, it's just a quick two and a half minute video here. Whoops. Um, one thing, uh, with, since this is being recorded, you'll have this presentation um, later as well. So if you want to come back to these terms as they are uh, on this slide, um, you'll be able uh, to do that. Um, so one of the things in the video, um, it said genderqueer, and another way to talk about that is gender nonconforming. 
uh, which is the term that I'll be using um, throughout the, the, my part of the presentation. So, um, do we have any questions yet now? Okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on to talking about Title IX. So Title IX in general, and I think the way that most people think about it, um, is in terms of sexual assault, um, especially on college campuses. Um, but this, in general, is a comprehensive federal law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, and that works not just at universities, but um, in any educational institution. So including, um, including uh, elementary schools, uh, high schools. Um, so um, that's why it applies here with uh, transgender students as well. So a, um, under Title IX, no medical diagnosis or treatment is required as a prerequisite for a student to be treated consistent with their gender identity. So uh, if school documents reflect that a student uh, is biologically female, um, but they have now uh, transitioned into, uh, uh, with their gender identity, and now identify as male, uh, they don't need to have a medical diagnosis or a doctor's note or a psychologist's note or anything like that uh, on, uh, on record. Um, the moment that a student discloses a change in gender identity, um, then all staff and uh, teachers and administration must start treating that student consistent with that gender identity, not what the sex, the assigned sex is uh, on their school records. Um, <clears throat> when, it's, when the school learns that a student is transgender, Title IX requires that the school staff and teachers treat the student in a way consistent with their gender identity, um, even if the identification documents, so not just school records, but even things like a driver's license or a state ID, um, those count as well. Uh, if gender-based harassment against these students takes place within the school and the school fails to properly address it, the school must make prompt and effective steps to end that harassment and preventing a recurrence uh, and remedy its effects as quickly as possible. Failure to do this as well as failure to treat students in a way consistent with their gender identity could result in a Title IX violation. Um, and how this relates to the bathroom issue, uh, which has been a big um, topic of conversation since around March and April. Um, and this is something that is required by Title IX. Uh, and the way that this works in compliance with um, the Justice Department is that a school may provide separate facilities on the basis of sex, but must allow transgender students to use facilities consistent with their gender identity. A school may not require transgender students to use facilities inconsistent with that gender identity or to use individual user facilities when other students are not required to do so. So if there are individual user facilities, that, that has to be an option for both trans and cis students. It's not something that only transgender students have to use. Um, a school may, however, make individual user options available um, to all those students who voluntarily seek additional privacy. Um, so if they want, if the school wants to be able to provide um, a bathroom for trans students, it has to be available to cis students as well. Um, or they can stick with the separate sex bathrooms, but they have to allow that transgender student to use the bathroom that aligns with their gender identity. Um, and the reason that this bathroom issue is so important um, is we saw after North Carolina passed its bathroom restriction bill in April, um, co-founder of the Trans Lifeline reported that their call volume nearly doubled. On any given day, the calls usually peak at around 200 calls per day. After, right after the law passed, the day after, the calls spiked to 357. Um, so denying the basic human right of using a bathroom has a profound effect on the mental health of trans students and trans people. Um, another thing to consider also is that if you're providing a bathroom uh, that gives a trans student a choice 
to use one consistent with their gender identity or to use a single service bathroom um, is that you have to also have an environment that lets that student make that choice. If they don't feel like they're safe to make a choice about a bathroom that aligns with their gender identity, then we're not really giving them a choice. Um, so you might, your school or your community organization or whatever it may be, may give students that choice, but it's also important that it, to understand that it's more than just that one choice. It's about making an environment safe for trans students to have that choice and to make that choice publicly. Um, any questions? Yeah, we, we do have a question. Um, so, so the question that was asked, there were two. Um, so what you were talking about kind of answers the question so far, but maybe you want to speak a little bit more on it. The question states, um, how is the description playing out in states that have legislated and passed a law that defines gender identity as assigned at birth and chromosomes? Say that one more time. So how does the description playing out in states uh, that have legislated and passed a law that defines gender identity as assigned at birth? Um, and then the chromosomes that are involved with that as well. How is it playing out? I need to actually see the question. Okay. Uh, so an example of how that's playing out um, where uh, states are in are defining gender identity and assigned sex at birth the same, uh, is it's not playing out well. Um, what we can see happening in Texas right now um, is an example of that, um, where we have a school in Fort Worth that is following the um, Title IX rules of um, the Justice Department by allowing a student to use a bathroom consistent with their gender identity. Um, and then we have state, state government um, trying to take that away. Um, and so that's not, and you have to, you have the, the federal government and the state government defining sex and gender identity differently. Um, and that's where the, a, a big part of that clash is coming from. Um, so it's not, it's not playing out well um, that school in Fort Worth is currently being sued um, by the state. So. Um, so that's an example of how when we conflate those two, we conflate uh, gender identity and then sex assigned at birth, um, that uh, this has not only social ramifications for students, but also legal ramifications for, um, for local governments and for schools. Does that answer your question? Any other questions so far? OK, cool. Um, all right, so let's move on to, uh, and again, um, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to get um, these slides later. Um, some facts to know. Um, so we know uh, that 50 to 54 percent of trans students at any grade level, so elementary, middle school, through high school, are harassed or bullied at school. Um, we know that 55% of trans youth reported physical attacks because of their gender identity. Um, transgender youth are one-third more likely to suffer physical harassment on account of their gender expression than were um, gay, lesbian, and bisexual students. So. Um, one thing you might notice um, is that I'm not using the full acronym um, LGBT um, because while they are part of the same community, um, that oftentimes transgender students and transgender people will experience um, heightened levels of harassment or bullying um, and a different kind of experience that they have, uh, which is why I'm not using that uh, full acronym. Uh, all that often. Um, so in this case, transgender youth are uh, more likely to suffer physical uh, harassment than um, their uh, GL, uh, gay, lesbian, and bisexual peers. 45% um, of LGBT youth of color um, report experiencing verbal harassment in school regarding their race and their sexual orientation or their gender identity. 
um, and over 50% of trans youth will attempt suicide at least once before the age of 20. Um, so that's an incredible, that's an incredible number there. Um, so the harassment that trans students experience has a direct impact on their academic success. Consequences can range from truancy to dropping out of school, low academic performance to repeating grade levels, um, fear of going to school, um, and faking illness to avoid going to school altogether. Um, for teachers and administrators, it might seem outside of your requirements as teachers and administrators to consider or learn, learn about the social and cultural issues that students confront. But since these social and cultural issues pose specific challenges to students and directly affect their academic success, it's important that we do what we can to educate ourselves to support these students. So the harassment and uh, bullying that students encounter at schools does not always occur in the classroom or in range of teachers. Um, so oftentimes, um, I'll, I'll read or even hear from teachers themselves that they don't believe that this type of bullying or harassment happens because they don't ever see it. Um, but it's not going to happen right in front of you in your classroom. Um, it happens in buses. It happens in bathrooms. It happens in crowded hallways at recess when, um, you know, the students are scattered about um, and, they can, and teachers can't see everything. Um, so just because we might not see it happening in front of us does not mean that it's not happening. Um, and I want to say something about um, the additional challenges that trans youth of, youth of color will experience. Um, they experience additional challenges from within their communities and from without their communities. Um, so in addition to transphobia and gender-based discrimi discrimination, they must also confront racism. Um, Black trans people are at the highest risk for targeted violence by peers and law enforcement. At least 47% of black trans people will be incarcerated. Um, so the number, the black trans people are um, at higher risk of targeted violence um, from outside their community. From within their own communities, um, trans students of color risk rejection. Um, in many Latina uh, and Latino communities, machismo and Catholicism contribute to homophobic and transphobic attitudes that disrupt efforts to reach Latina youth with HIV and STD prevention and information. Asian American and Pacific Islander trans youth feel they have shamed their families when they fail to live up to cultural expectations to marry and have children. Native Americans have historically had a gender fluid culture However, Native American communities now face humiliation and violence because of their sexual orientation um, or gender expression. Um, so one thing to think about, and this is an example that I got from another agency who was talking about suicide and stress, is that when we think about levels of oppression that different people face, um, if you have a trans student um, holding a stack of books and they have one stack, uh, they have one book already, that's pretty heavy um, because of their gender identity. And then you add on another heavy book that has to do with racism. Um, that's another weight that they have to carry. Um, and then if you break that down even further into Latino communities and what they experience in that, that's another added book. That's another thing they have to carry. Um, the, the fear of shaming their family is another book, another added stressor, another added weight, another added book of oppression. Um, and so you can see how carrying all of that with them um, would directly impact their success at school, how they feel motivated to even go to school, how they feel motivated to have a future um, when they know that they're going to be targeted for violence. Um, so uh, those types of uh, things that we need to be thinking about um, when we have these students in our classrooms and we're trying to reach them with education and to encourage them to succeed academically, um, that they have a lot of social and cultural pressures working on them and against them at the same time. So in the end, um, both trans, gender non-conforming, and cisgender and straight students are all hurt by negative attitudes and behaviors about gender. In attempts to try to conform to societal standards for masculine and feminine gender expression and sexual orientation, 
trans youth may engage in increasingly risky sexual behavior. They are also more likely to turn to substances to cope with struggles that arise from their gender identity. On the other hand, cisgender and straight youth may also engage in increasingly risky sexual behavior to prove that they are not trans or gay. Uh, so these um, understandings that we have about um, how men and women, boys and girls should be acting, um, dressing, behaving, um, how they are expressing their gender and their gender identity, um, that those affect everybody, um, not just the trans youth, but also um, uh, straight and cis, cis youth as well. Um, questions here? Okay. Hold on just one second. I'm trying to see this question. Matt, can you? Oh, there we go. Never mind. This question says, um, I have been involved in the Fort Worth battle. Um, Oh, that's not a question. I'm sorry, but someone, someone here in the in the um, in the, attending this has been involved in in this type of situation. So, um, I think that's it so far. Okay, um, and if you have questions, again, as we go along, just go ahead and dump those into the question box, and we'll um, again pause uh, and get to those um, as we go along. So I'm going to turn things over to Janet here. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is the importance of creating a safe space for all youth um, and how we can do that. Um, one of the things I think that's really important is to think about what uh, environment you're in and what the um, what the messages are that you're giving out in your environment and how people um, talk and um, address each other is one of the biggest things. Um, what pronouns and identifiers we use is really important and it's okay to ask someone what pronoun they prefer. Um, I know that it's uncomfortable sometimes, but when I talk to youth, uh, they absolutely would rather be asked directly in a respectful way um, rather than have someone just assume. Um, it's much more uh, acceptable to them for someone to start a conversation with them and ask them how they identify, how they want to be referred to, um, rather than just going with what the paperwork says. Or um, sometimes when I do groups, we, we always do introductions. And so in introductions, um, I usually ask them to share with me their name, um, their grade level, and what pronoun they prefer I use. Um, that way, it's just out there. Um, they can respond any way they want to. They don't have to respond if they don't want to. Um, but it gives them the opportunity to let us know where they're at, um, how they're feeling at that moment. And Layla talked earlier about Title IX, um, stating that we need to treat students consistent with their gender identity, so that's part of it. What pronoun we're using to address them is part of um, abiding by Title IX. I have had students tell me that um, they have teachers who refuse to use the pronoun that they identify as. Um, and that certainly has a negative effect on the student, not only school attendance, but their performance in school. Um, it has a negative effect on their ability to learn. Um, so we need to really pay attention to that kind of stuff. Um, also, I think it's really important to make yourself known as an ally. Um, it's easy to be a silent ally. It's 
one step further to let people know that you're a safe person, to let people know that your area is a safe place. Um, I think the first thing we have to do when we are identifying ourselves as an ally is we first have to think within ourselves what kind of biases we have, how we were brought up, what kinds of things we were taught. As all of us grew up in this, this world that um, doesn't always teach us to be accepting. So we need to look inside ourselves first and figure out where we are and then make sure we're aware of that. Um, but I, I'm a huge advocate for somehow letting kids know that you're a safe person. So again, it goes back to if you ask them um, how they want to be referred to, if you ask them what their preferred pronoun is, they know you're someone they can come and talk to. Um, being an ally is fantastic. We need allies. Everybody needs allies, but we also need to let people know that you're an ally. Um, so I think it's important not only to fight against discrimination and bullying, but it's also important to help people stand up for themselves. Um, if there's anything you can put in your classroom, if there's anything you can um, put on your desk or on your door or um, anywhere so that kids know they can come to you and talk to you. Um, the other part of being an ally is understanding confidentiality. Um, if you have a student who comes to you and is struggling and um, either isn't really sure or, or feels like they're transgender or just has some gender identity questions, um, it's not your job to go off and talk to their parents or to share that information with anyone. Um, it's actually illegal to do that. Your job is to keep confidentiality for that student and be a support system for that student. Um, obviously, most of us are mandated reporters, so that's a different scenario. Um, but when you're talking about gender identity issues, sometimes going to their parents could actually put them in more danger. Um, letting other people know can put them in more danger um, for things like bullying, um, for things like suicide. We do know that the suicide rate um, seems to increase as the number of people who know that person is transgender increases. Um, it's found to be 50% higher um, if everyone around them knows that they're transgender. So it's really important that we keep their confidentiality in an effort to keep them safe. Um, they've come to us. If we're showing that, that we're safe people, they've come to us to talk to us. Um, so it's important that we are able to um, respect that. Okay. All right. So um, the other thing for creating a safe space is being able to intervene when there is something going on. So if you witness um, some sort of hostile action, I think lately we've kind of gotten um, less likely to intervene in a bullying situation or um, in any kind of argument or fight between young people. A lot of us are taught more to let them work it out. Um, but in a situation like this, we are talking about a potentially life and death situation. We need to intervene. Um, this is something that affects a person's whole life if they're being harassed because of their gender identity. Um, so we need to step in and we need to figure out ways to put a stop to it when it's happening. Um, I would also say we need to go beyond the intervening and have conversations with the other adults around us. Have conversations about attitudes and behaviors that you're seeing and how you can address those things. Um, if you're a teacher, talk to other teachers. Talk to the administration. Make sure that, that the other people in your agency or institution, make sure they know what's happening. Um, 
like Layla said, it's not always right in front of adults. So if you do see something, make sure that other people are aware and ask for changes. Ask for things to have a policy about um, transgender students and bullying. Ask to have um, policies about how to intervene safely or ask to have trainings about that. Um, bring ideas about what things work for you and share them. Don't be afraid to have conversations with other adults um, who can also have a positive impact for these students. And then also, this kind of is what I was talking about also, but make sure that your whole school is able to have some sort of recognition. Um, I, I know that there are national days where people celebrate different things and sometimes, very rarely, the schools that I'm in um, are celebrating those, those national days along with everything I see on social media. So maybe when you find out about those days, you spread the word at your school. You suggest to your administration that you go ahead and support those days. Um, an example was like in October, they have something called Spirit Day. And people wear purple to stand up against bullying um, for the LGBTQ community. So everyone could wear purple. Or if you are in support of that, then you wear purple and a student who maybe isn't out or a student who's struggling sees you wearing purple, they know you're a safe person. It's something not it doesn't even have to be spoken. Um, I think it's important to show them by doing little things like that that you are a supporter. Um, also, like I said, asking for trainings. Um, have people come in and talk about stereotypes. Have people come in and talk about the issues that you're dealing with um, at your school in particular or, or your workplace in particular. Um, it's also been found that when adults and students work together, when they collaborate on something, whether it's um, just a project or if it's creating a group, um, a support kind of group, um, whatever that is, if you can have adults who are staff or teachers actively involved with those students, um, that will make a big positive impact on them. Um, having a gay-straight alliance, that's something that's typically run by a student, um, but it has to have a teacher, uh, mentor, or liaison. Um, those kinds of groups, those kinds of organizations are good for students so that they can know they have a safe place to go, they can find other students who are also safe, and you have the adult who's involved also. So don't be afraid to try to initiate those kinds of groups in your schools. I know a lot of schools have gay straight alliances already, um, but maybe you can have a different group that's called something different so there isn't a stigma of attending those kinds of meetings. Um, and certainly feel free to, you know, be creative, come up with things that you see your particular students or your particular young people struggling with and um, reach out to us. We can, we can maybe help come up with some ideas for creating safe spaces. Um, so, uh, I want to address a question uh, that we got here. Um, uh, kind of a question. Uh, if we have any comments on the public health concerns being part of the strategy to support bathroom availability, um, for example, urinary tract infections. Um, so a couple of things. Um, by having gender neutral bathrooms or bathroom integration, um, that there's no more, there's no higher of a risk for uh, urinary tract infections or SEs than there are from any other type of restroom. Um, a public restroom is a public restroom no matter who's using it. Um, and also just kind of in general, some of the panic that has been created about um, how dirty toilet seats are is a little bit overblown. Um, you can't catch an STD from a toilet seat. 
um, or anything like that. And that's coming from the president of the American um, Association of um, Microbiology. So. so I think I'm reading that question to say, or that comment to say, um, the transgender kids um, sometimes aren't going to the restroom because they aren't allowed to use the restroom that they identify with. Um, so they're holding it all day long and then they're getting urinary tract infections because of that. Um, and I think I've read about that also. Um, and that's definitely another reason that we need to be allowing them. We, we need to allow our, our young people um, not only to, you know, it's, it's not just a matter of feeling comfortable going in the bathroom. It's also a matter of being able to use the bathroom and um, not have any kind of health implications because they're holding it all day. Yeah, um, sorry if I read that question incorrectly, but there has been, um, <laughs> when I was looking at it earlier, there are, are concerns about the public health of um, uh, what I was addressing as well. But um, what Janet's saying um, is that uh, a, a complying with Title IX just by having the option for the bathroom, again, is not enough. You have to have that entire environment um, as a safe place for a student to be able to make that choice um, safely so that they don't have to deal with urinary tract infections from um, holding their urine in all day. Um, so again, it's about, it's about creating the whole space as safe, not just the bathroom. Um, we've got another question here. Do we have any general statistics on rates of sexual assault and dating violence amongst transgender youth? Um, we have a, this is kind of a tricky statistic to try to get a handle on as well, separating out what's happening with youth and what's happening with adults. Um, the statistic that we do have for uh, adults um, who experience sexual assault um, that are transgender is sitting at about 50%, um, which is again a very high number. Um, and then with dating violence, I don't have um, an exact statistic. Uh, for that one. Janet, do you know? No. Um, and as far as transgender people committing sexual assault? Right. Yeah, there's um, uh, as far as all, um, as all studies have shown um, with specifically with the bathroom issue that there's never been a report of a transgender person um, committing sexual assault in a bathroom against a non-transgender person or against anyone in general. So um, I think we had another question. Yes, there we go. Is that it? That's it? Cool. Okay. Um, so, if you have any other questions, now would be the time to ask them. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions coming across um, my screen here. Um, a couple of things there is, uh, I do want to have one more poll question, two more poll questions, sorry. <laughs> um, so we've got one of those coming up right now. The question is, the way your school community is now, um, from students to staff to trans students and or gender non-conforming students, do they feel safe? And that'd be yes, no, or not sure. Okay, um, so most people said uh, not sure, um, almost half said no, and only 8% said yes. Um, so to those of you who said not sure, one thing I would suggest, if, you, if there is a transgender student in your school or even a trans teacher or staff member, um, that and they're, um, they've disclosed, um, then ask them 
ask them if they feel safe, ask them if um, they think that other trans students or staff would feel safe. Um, that's going to meeting, meeting these students where they are, figuring out their lived experience in that school is going to be the best way um, to answer this question um, and then move forward making the, uh, the proper steps. Um, so for those of you who said no, which is almost half, um, to, I would encourage you to take a couple of additional steps. So one would be um, educating yourself um, to be well informed about um, gender identity um, and gender nonconforming students in that community. Um, and then try to start integrating some of these steps that Janet talked about in your school. Um, go to your administrator, go to other teachers that you feel have the same concerns that you do, um, and start making active steps um, to move forward into creating this safe space. Um, and for those of you who said yes, um, good. <laughs> uh, one more. Uh, we had we did have uh, a few questions, Layla, and I think you know all of us can kind of attest to this one. Uh, Bakara asked, "I work in schools educating youth on DV and sexual assault. Is there a way we can use more gender neutral language to assure transgender students feel heard, safe, protected, other than addressing Title Nine?" Yes, so one of the things that we've done at B Project um, is we use a lot of scenarios and examples and role plays um, in our um, sessions with the students. And so one of the things that we've done is to use more gender neutral names, uh, but not just to use gender neutral names, but actually have names in there where um, it would be clear that these are two men or these are two women. Um, so that we can be able to um, uh, address different kinds of relationships, not just straight relationships. And also um, that we, when we have uh, scenarios, we do try to use the pronouns they and them, um, which are gender neutral, um, which would speak to trans students and gender nonconforming students. And we also use the word partner. Yes. Um, we try to be very inclusive with our language and um, definitely we've had some students ask when you read a scenario sometimes the students will want to know is that a girl or is that a guy um, and so that allows us to, to discuss you know the dynamics does it really matter if it's a girl or a guy um, it, it always brings up good discussions and, and for also for me, I also work as an educator with Layla and Janet, uh, but being able to refer to the student by name and, and not really having to worry about pronouns without saying he or she or them or they, or saying John or, or Kara or Shane or whatever that person's name is, but being able to address them by name. And that not only goes for transgender students, but all students, that, that you as an educator um, is taking the time to actually get to know their names. What I find working with students really helps them in being able to be heard, not just for all students. Um, another question that was that was asked, um, do you share any wording that would help to persuade districts to get training necessary to help uh, transgender students, um, for example, like staff development? Um. Hold on. <laughs> on our screen, these, these questions are coming in a very small print. Like suicide prevention? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, types of trainings uh, like this where we, you know, start with learning the language um, that these students need to be hearing. Um, cultural sensitivity, I hate the word cultural sensitivity, um, but that is what they are. Um, uh, those types of trainings to get your staff um, more accustomed to, um, or at least better prepared um, to work with students that might be outside of their own cultural experience. Um, and then uh, also, like Janet said, um, suicide prevention, since this community is at a higher risk for suicide. Suicide prevention training um, is fantastic. Learning to recognize when a student might be in crisis um, would also be, um, I think, very helpful. 
probably crisis management and um, prevention, um, any kind of prevention trainings? Yes. Um, another question that we have here is, um, do you have any comments specifically to school nurses who have become the default point person uh, for the bathroom? Um, so it's never easy being kind of that point of contact, um, being kind of the first person um, there, um, hands-on dealing with what's going on. Um, so you're kind of in, it might feel like a stressful situation, but you're also kind of in a position of privilege to be kind of the first person um, to be there for this student. Um, so it is a it's a big responsibility, um, but if you're um, managing your own biases, recognize what you are managing them, um, using the correct language that we've talked about, um, making sure that that student feels um, feels affirmed and uh, heard and seen, um, that that's a kind of a first step um, to helping these students. And again, maybe as a school nurse, you could put something up in uh, the clinic or in your office um, that would indicate, you know, not only that you are the contact person they need to go to, but also that you are open and um, that you're an ally. Uh, okay, question here. What advice, if any, do you have for those of us who work in community organizations outside of the school district setting to encourage, pressure, our local schools to comply with Title IX? Um, one of the things that I would suggest um, is I, not that veiled threats are, you know, always helpful or even nice, um, but that to not comply with Title IX, you are exposing your whole school, or in this case, maybe a whole district, to a Title IX violation. Um, those types of violations can be investigated by the Justice Department. Um, that's not something that you want on, that any school or district wants on their record, um, to have that dragged out publicly. Um, so while that's not ideal, <laughs> that's not an ideal way to put pressure uh, but sometimes it does come down to that um, when you have officials, um, people in the top who are resistant to recognizing um, these students, recognizing this community, and wanting to move forward with social change uh, in their schools. Um, these types of legal pressures um, sometimes are is, is what does the trick, unfortunately. Um, last question here. I missed the very beginning. Yes. The presentation will be made available. We've been recording it, um, and so uh, we'll send. I will put it up on YouTube. Um, it'll be available. And someone did ask earlier if this can be, if you can use this webinar in schools or share it with schools, and you absolutely can. Um, and so we'll send the link around later um, as well. So any last questions? We have about a minute left before I've officially taken up too much of your time. Yes. And I, just, I just posted it down in the chat box, but you'll see um, youtube.com slash user slash the B project, all one word. Um, if you go to that site, you'll be able to see our YouTube page where we have um, a bunch of videos that we've posted, whether they're informational posts or informational videos about B project or um, our past webinar that we did back in June, trending. That's up there. You can go ahead and watch that. Um, so by the end of day today or by tomorrow, depending on how long it will take you to upload to YouTube, um, those will be available tomorrow at the latest. It will be available. We'll make sure we send out an email that, that says that it's available and you can watch it in case you missed it or you want to share it with other people, you want to share it on social media sites or whatever. Yes. And so um, uh, last thing uh, on this slide that's up right now, um, there's also a handout available, right? Yes. Um, that Matt uh, put up for you guys. Um, so what I've done is the, the resources that are on here, I've separated them into educational sites and then also resources for trans youth. Um, so the education piece is for, for you guys, for you as adult influencers in the students' lives to um, start 
a, a starting place to educate yourselves if you feel um, that this is new um, and comfortable. Um, uh, so that's for you guys. The other part, the resources, that is for the trans youth. There's the trans lifeline, um, which is a hotline uh, for students, um, and uh, uh, a crisis center. Um, and then also there's one called Refuge, um, which is a bathroom finding uh, resource. So um, you can give that to them um, to where they can find a public restroom that is safe, um, as well as some other sources there as well. So um, I'll be, later on, I'll be sending out um, a uh, link to the YouTube. We'll also be sending out a um, post survey um, some questions about just what you thought of the presentation, how Janet and I did, um, and then also I'll be wanting some feedback on what might be a good follow-up to this um, webinar as well. So what, what do you want to know now um, that you have this information? So um, start thinking about that um, so that it'll be there when you um, get the survey uh, later. And also, um, I know I'll say this for myself as well, um, but any time that we all send you something, whether it's a post-survey or it's the link to the YouTube, you know, we're also available for you all. You know, we, can, we also love networking um, with different people and that we're able, that you're able to, to just shoot us an email back. Um, in the past, at the past webinar that we had, I had someone send me an email and I wasn't able to answer their question, but I was able to get them um, resource to a person. So TCFD, they have a great prevention team and they have a great um, networking team that are able to answer a lot of these questions that they're facing. Um, TASA is the same. Those are, if we're not able to answer something, you know, those are two people that we, that are, those are two agencies that we send stuff off to. But like, hey, um, what are your thoughts on this? Do you have a response for this? Can you get back to these people? And, and that's basically their whole job is that they uh, work with people who are in prevention and intervention and being able to work with um, others to be able to get your answers question. The questions answered. Sorry. Okay. Um, I believe that is everything. I don't think we have any more questions. I will leave the present the webinar up for a few more minutes just in case there's any last questions and we'll just be able to respond to you um, in a chat box. But if you have to leave, we thank you for, for joining us today. And like we said, this will be up on YouTube at some point later today or tomorrow at the latest and we'll get everything out to you all. And if you have any questions, please be able to email us or anything like that and we'll be able to we'd gladly um, be able to assist y'all. Thank y'all for stopping in.